Chapter Two of Brother Jacob by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Two. It was nearly six years after the departure of Mr. David Foe for the West Indies that the vacant shop in the market place at Grimworth was understood to have been let to the stranger with a sallow complexion and a buff cravat, whose first appearance had caused some excitement in the bar of the Woolpack, where he had called to wait for the coach. Grimworth, to a discerning eye, was a good place to set up shopkeeping in. There was no competition in it at present. The church people had their own grocer and draper, the dissenters had theirs, and the two or three butchers found a ready market for their joints without strict reference to religious persuasion, except that the rector's wife had given a general order for the veal sweetbreads and the mutton kidneys, while Mr. Rod, the Baptist minister, had requested that, so far as was compatible with the fair accommodation of other customers, the sheep's trotters might be reserved for him. And it was likely to be a growing place, for the trustees of Mr. Zephaniah Cripps' charity, under the stimulus of a late visitation by commissioners, were beginning to apply long accumulating funds to the rebuilding of the Yellow Coat School, which was henceforth to be carried forward on a greatly extended scale, the testator having left no restrictions concerning the curriculum, but only concerning the coat. The shopkeepers at Grimworth were by no means unanimous as to the advantages promised by this prospect of increased population and trading, being substantial men who liked doing a quiet business in which they were sure of their customers, and could calculate their returns to a nicety. Hitherto it had been held a point of honour by the families in Grimworth Parish to buy their sugar and their flannel at the shop where their fathers and mothers had bought before them. But if newcomers were to bring in the system of neck-and-neck -neck trading, and solicit feminine eyes by grown pieces laid in fan-like folds, and surmounted by artificial flowers, giving them a factitious charm, for on what human figure would a gown sit like a fan, or what female head was like a bunch of china asters? Or, if the new grocers were to fill their windows with mountains of currants and sugar, made seductive by contrast and tickets, what security was there for Grimworth that a vagrant spirit in shopping, once introduced, would not in the end carry the most important families to the larger market town of Cattleton, where, business being done on a system of small profits and quick returns, the fashions were of the freshest, and goods of all kinds might be bought at an advantage? With this view of the times predominant among the tradespeople at Grimworth, their uncertainty concerning the nature of the business which the sallow complexioned stranger was about to set up in the vacant shop naturally gave some additional strength to the fears of the less sanguine if he was going to sell drapery it was probable that a pale-faced fellow like that would deal in showy and inferior articles printed cottons and muslins which would leave their dye in the wash-tub jobbed linen full of knots and flannel that would soon look like gauze in grocery then it was to be hoped that no mother of a family would trust the teas of an untried grocer. Such things have been known in some parishes as tradesmen going about canvassing for custom with cards in their pockets. When people came from nobody knew where, there was no knowing what they might do. It was a thousand pities that Mr. Moffat, the auctioneer and broker, had died without leaving anybody to follow him in the business, and Mrs. Cleve's trustee ought to have known better than to let a shop to a stranger. Even the discovery that ovens were being put up on the premises, and that the shop was, in fact, being fitted up for a confectioner and pastry-cook's business, hitherto unknown in Grimworth, did not quite suffice to turn the scale in the newcomer's favour, though the landlady at the Woolpack defended him warmly, said he seemed to be a very clever young man, and from what she could make out came of a very good family, indeed, was most likely a good many people's betters. It certainly made a blaze of light and colour, almost as if a rainbow had suddenly descended into the market-place, when, one fine morning, the shutters were taken down from the new shop, and the two windows displayed their decorations. On one side, 
there were the variegated tints of collared and marbled meats set off by bright green leaves the pale brown of glazed pies the rich tones of sauces and bottled fruits enclosed in their veil of glass altogether a sight to bring tears into the eyes of a dutch painter and on the other there was a predominance of the more delicate hues of pink and white and yellow and buff in the abundant lozenges candies sweet biscuits and icings which to the eyes of a bilious person might easily have blended into a fairy landscape in turner's latest style what a sight to dawn upon the eyes of grimworth children they almost forgot to go to their dinner that day their appetites being preoccupied with imaginary sugar plums and i think even punch setting up his tabernacle in the market-place would not have succeeded in drawing them away from those shop windows where they could according to gradations of size and strength the biggest and strongest being nearest the window and the little ones in the outermost rows lifting wide open eyes and mouths towards the upper tier of jars like small birds at meal-time the elder inhabitants pished and shored a little at the folly of the new shopkeeper in venturing on such an outlay in goods that would not keep to be sure christmas was coming but what housewife in grimworth would not think shame to furnish forth her table with articles that were not home cooked no no mr edward freely as he called himself was deceived if he thought grimworth money was to flow into his pockets on such terms Edward Freely was the name that shone in gilt letters on a mazarine ground over the door-place of the new shop a Generous sounding name that might have belonged to an open-hearted Improvident hero of an old comedy who would have delighted in raining sugared almonds like a new manna gift among the small generation outside the windows But mr. Edward Freely was a man whose impulses were kept in due subordination he held that the desire for sweets and pastry must only be satisfied in a direct ratio with the power of paying for them If the smallest children in Grimworth would go to him with a halfpenny in its tiny fist He would after wringing the halfpenny deliver a just equivalent of rock He was not a man to cheat even the smallest child he often said so observing at the same time that he loved honesty and also that he was very tender-hearted Although he didn't show his feelings as some people did Either in reward of such virtue or according to some more hidden law of sequence Mr. Freely's business in spite of prejudice started under favorable auspices For mrs. Challoner the rector's wife was among the earliest customers at the shop Thinking it only right to encourage a new parishioner who had made a decorous appearance at church and She found mr. Freely a most civil obliging young man and intelligent to a surprising degree for a confectioner well principled too for in giving her useful hints about choosing sugars he had thrown much light on the dishonesty of other tradesmen moreover he had been in the west indies and had seen the very estate which had been her poor grandfather's property and he said the missionaries were the only cause of the negro's discontent an observing young man evidently Mrs. Challoner ordered wine biscuits and olives and gave mr. Freely to understand that she should find his shop a great convenience So did the doctor's wife and so did mrs. Gate at the large carding mill who having high connections frequently visiting her Might be expected to have a large consumption of ratafias and macaroons The less aristocratic matrons of Grimworth seemed likely at first to justify their husband's confidence That they would never pay a percentage of profits on drop cakes instead of making their own Or get up a hollow show of liberal housekeeping by purchasing slices of colored meat when a neighbor came in for supper But it is my task to narrate the gradual corruption of Grimworth manners from their primitive simplicity a melancholy task if it were not cheered by the prospect of the fine peripatia or downfall by which the progress of the corruption was ultimately checked it was young mrs steen the veterinary surgeon's wife who first gave way to temptation i fear she had been rather over-educated for her station in life for she knew by heart many passengers in lalla rook the corsair and the siege of corinth 
which had given her a distaste for domestic occupations and caused her a withering disappointment at the discovery that mr steen since his marriage had lost all interest in the bulbul openly preferred discussing the nature of spavin with a coarse neighbor and was angry if the pudding turned out watery indeed was simply a top-booted vet who came in hungry at dinner-time and not in the least like a nobleman turned corsair out of pure scorn for his race or like a renegade with a turban and crescent unless it were in the irritability of his temper and scorn is such a very different thing in top boots this brutal man had invited a supper party for christmas eve when he would expect to see mince pies on the table mrs steen had prepared her mincemeat and had devoted much butter fine flour and labor to the mixing of a batch of pies in the morning but they proved to be so very heavy when they came out of the oven that she could only think with trembling of the moment when her husband should catch sight of them on the supper table he would storm at her she was certain and before all the company and then she should never help crying it was so dreadful to think she had come to that after the bulbul and everything suddenly the thought darted through her mind that this once she might send for a dish of mince pies from freely's she knew he had some but what was to become of the eighteen heavy mince pies oh it was of no use thinking about that it was very expensive indeed making mince pies at all was a great expense when they were not sure to turn out well it would be much better to buy them ready-made you paid a little more for them but there was no risk of waste such was the sophistry with which this misguided young woman enough mrs steen sent for the mince pies and i am grieved to add garbled her household accounts in order to conceal the fact from her husband this was the second step in a downward course all owing to a young woman's being out of harmony with her circumstances yearning after renegades and bulbuls and being subject to claims from a veterinary surgeon fond of mince pies the third step was to harden herself by telling the fact of the bought mince pies to her intimate friend mrs mole who had already guessed it and who subsequently encouraged herself in buying a mould of jelly instead of exerting her own skill by the reflection that other people did the same sort of thing the infection spread soon there was a party or clique in grimworth on the side of buying at freely's and many husbands kept for some time in the dark on this point innocently swallowed at two mouthfuls a tart on which they were paying a profit of a hundred per cent and as innocently encouraged a fatal disingenuousness in the partners of their bosoms by praising the pastry others more keen-sighted winked at the too frequent presentation on washing days and at impromptu suppers of superior spiced beef which flattered their palates more than the cold remnants they had formerly been contented with every housewife who had once bought at freely's felt a secret joy when she detected a similar perversion in her neighbor's practice and soon only two or three old-fashioned mistresses of families held out in the protest against the growing demoralization saying to their neighbors who came to sup with them i can't offer you freely's beef or freely's cheesecakes everything in our house is home made i'm afraid you'll hardly have any appetite for our plain pastry the doctor whose cook was not satisfactory the curate who kept no cook and the mining agent who was a great bon vivant even began to rely on freely for the greater part of their dinner when they wished to give an entertainment of some brilliancy in short the business of manufacturing the more fanciful viands was fast passing out of the hands of maids and matrons in private families and was becoming the work of a special commercial organ i am not ignorant that this sort of thing is called the inevitable course of civilization division of labor and so forth and that the maids and matrons may be said to have had their hands set free from cookery to add to the wealth of society in some other way only it happened at grimworth which to be sure was a low place that the maids and matrons could do nothing with their hands at all better than cooking not even those who had always made heavy cakes and leathery pastry and so it came to pass that the progress of civilization at grimworth was not otherwise apparent than in the impoverishment of men 
the gossiping idleness of women and the heightening prosperity of mr edward freely the yellow coat school was a double source of profit to the calculating confectioner for he opened an eating room for the superior workmen employed on the new school and he accommodated the pupils at the old school by giving great attention to the fancy sugar department when i think of the sweet-tasted swans and other ingenious white shapes crunched by the small teeth of that rising generation i am glad to remember that a certain amount of, of calcareous food had been held good for young creatures whose bones are not quite formed for i have observed these delicacies to have an inorganic flavour which would have recommended them greatly to that young lady of the spectator's acquaintance who habitually made her dessert on the stems of tobacco pipes as for the confectioner himself he made his way gradually into grimworth homes as his commodities did in spite of some initial repugnance somehow or other his reception as a guest seemed a thing that required justifying like the purchasing of his pastry in the first place he was a stranger and therefore open to suspicion secondly the confectionery business was so entirely new at grimworth that its place in the scale of rank had not been distinctly ascertained there was no doubt about drapers and grocers when they came of good old grimworth families like mr luff and mr prettyman they visited with the palfreys who farmed their own land played many a game at whist with the doctor and condescended a little towards the timber merchant who had lately taken to the coal trade also and had got new furniture but whether a confectioner should be admitted to this higher level of respectability or should be understood to find his associates among butchers and bakers was a new question on which tradition threw no light his being a bachelor was in his favour and would perhaps have been enough to turn the scale even if mr edwards freely's other personal pretensions had been of an entirely insignificant cast but so far from this it very soon appeared that he was a remarkable young man who had been in the west indies and had seen many wonders by sea and land and that he could charm the ears of grimworth desdemonas with stories of strange fishes especially sharks which he had stabbed in the nick of time by bravely plunging overboard just as the monster was turning on its side to devour the cook's mate of terrible fevers which he had undergone in a land where the wind blows from all quarters at once of rounds of toast cast straight from the breadfruit trees of toes bitten off by land crabs of large honours that had been offered to him as a man who knew what was what and was therefore particularly needed in a tropical climate and of a creole heiress who had wept bitterly at his departure such conversational talents as these we know will overcome disadvantages of complexion and young towers whose cheeks were of the finest pink set off by a fringe of dark whisker was quite eclipsed by the presence of the sallow mr freely so exceptional a confectioner elevated the business and might well begin to make disengaged hearts flutter a little fathers and mothers were naturally more slow and cautious in their recognition of the newcomer's merits he's an amusing fellow said mr prettyman the highly respectable grocer mrs prettyman was a miss fothergill and her sister had married a london mercer he's an amusing fellow and i've no objection to his making one at the oyster club but he's a bit too fond of riding the high horse he's uncommonly knowing i'll allow but how came he to go to the indies i should like that answered it's unnatural in a confectioner i'm not fond of people that have been beyond seas if they can't give a good account how they happen to go when folks go so far off it's because they've got little credit near a home that's my opinion however he's got some good rum but i don't want to be hand and glove with him for all that it was this kind of dim suspicion which beclouded the view of mr freely's qualities in the maturer minds of grimworth through the early months of his residence there but when the confectioner ceased to be a novelty the suspicions also ceased to be novel and people got tired of hinting at them especially as they seemed to be refuted by his advancing prosperity and importance mr freely was becoming a person of influence in the parish he was found useful as an overseer of the poor having great firmness in enduring other people's pain which firmness he said was due to his great benevolence 
He always did what was good for people in the end. Mr. Chaloner had even selected him as clergyman's church warden, for he was a very handy man, and much more of Mr. Chaloner's opinion in everything about church business than the older parishioners. Mr. Freely was a very regular churchman, but at the Oyster Club he was sometimes a little free in his conversation, more than hinting at a life of sultanic self-indulgence, which he had passed in the West Indies, shaking his head now and then, and smiling rather bitterly, as men are wont to do when they intimate that they have become a little too wise to be instructed about a world which has long been flat and stale to them. For some time he was quite general in his attentions to the fair sex, combining the gallantries of a ladies' man with the severity of criticism on the person and manners of absent bells, which tended rather to stimulate in the feminine breast the desire to conquer the approval of so fastidious a judge. Nothing short of the very best in the department of female charms and virtues could suffice to kindle the ardour of Mr. Edward Freely, who had become familiar with the most luxuriant and dazzling beauty in the West Indies. It may seem incredible that a confectioner should have ideas and conversation so much resembling those to be met with in a higher walk of life, but it must be remembered that he had not merely travelled, he had also bow legs and a sallow, small-featured visage, so that nature herself had stamped him for a fastidious connoisseur of the fair sex. At last, however, it seemed clear that Cupid had found a sharper arrow than usual, and that Mr. Freely's heart was pierced. It was the general talk among the young people at Grimworth. But was it really love, and not rather ambition? Miss Fully Love, the timber merchant's daughter, was quite sure that if she were Miss Penny Palfrey, she would be cautious. It was not a good sign when men looked so much above themselves for a wife for it was no less a person than Miss Penelope Palfrey, second daughter of the Mr. Palfrey who farmed his own land, that had attracted Mr. Freely's peculiar regard, and conquered his fastidiousness. And no wonder, for the ideal, as exhibited in the finest waxwork, was perhaps never so closely approached by the real, as in the person of the pretty Penelope. Her yellowish flaxen hair did not curl naturally, I admit, but its bright, crisp ringlets were such smooth, perfect miniature tubes that you would have longed to pass your little finger through them and feel their soft elasticity. She wore them in a crop, for in those days, when society was in a healthier state, young ladies wore crops long after they were twenty, and Penelope was not yet nineteen. Like the waxen ideal, she had round blue eyes and round nostrils in her little nose, and teeth such as the ideal would be seen to have if ever she showed them. Altogether, she was a small, round thing, as neat as a pink and white double daisy, and as guileless, for I hope it does not argue guile in a pretty damsel of nineteen to think that she should like to have a bow and be engaged, when her elder sister had already been in that position a year and a half. To be sure, there was young Towers always coming to the house, but Penny felt convinced he only came to see her brother, for he never had anything to say to her, and never offered her his arm, and was as awkward and silent as possible. It was not unlikely that Mr. Freely had early been smitten by Penny's charms, as brought under his observation at church, but he had to make his way in society a little before he could come into nearer contact with them, and even after he was well received in Grimworth families, it was a long while before he could converse with Penny otherwise than in an incidental meeting at Mr. Luff's. It was not so easy to get invited to Long Meadows, the residence of the Palfreys, for although Mr. Palfrey had been losing money of late years, not being able quite to recover his feet after the terrible moraine which forced him to borrow, his family were far from considering themselves on the same level, as the old established tradespeople with whom they visited. The greatest people, even kings and queens, must visit with somebody, and the equals of the great are scarce. They were especially scarce at Grimworth, which, as I have before observed, was a low parish, mentioned with the most scornful brevity in gazetteers. Even the great people there were far behind those of their own standing in other parts of the realm. Mr. Palfrey's farmyard doors had the paint all worn off them, 
and the front garden walks had long been merged in a general weediness. Still, his father had been called Squire Palfrey, and had been respected by the last Grimworth generation as a man who could afford to drink too much in his own house. Pretty Penny was not blind to the fact that Mr. Freely admired her, and she felt sure that it was he who had sent her a beautiful valentine. But her sister seemed to think so lightly of him. All young ladies think lightly of the gentleman to whom they are not engaged. The Penny never dared mention him, and trembled and blushed whenever they met him, thinking of the valentine, which was very strong in its expressions, and which she felt guilty of knowing by heart. A man who had been to the Indies, and knew the sea so well, seemed to her a sort of public character, almost like Robinson Crusoe or Captain Cook, and Penny had always wished her husband to be a remarkable personage, likely to be put in Mangnall's questions, with which register of the immortals she had become acquainted during her one year at a boarding school. Only it seemed strange that a remarkable man should be a confectioner and pastry cook, and this anomaly quite disturbed Penny's dreams. Her brothers, she knew, laughed at men who couldn't sit on horseback well, and called them tailors, but her brothers were very rough, and were quite without that power of anecdote which made Mr. Freely such a delightful companion. He was a very good man, she thought, for she had heard him say at Mr. Luff's one day that he always wished to do his duty in whatever state of life he might be placed, and he knew a great deal of poetry, for one day he had repeated a verse of a song. She wondered if he had made the words of the valentine. It ended in this way. Without thee it is pain to live, but with thee it were sweet to die. Poor Mr. Freely, her father would very likely object, she felt sure he would, for he always called Mr. Freely that sugar-plum fellow. Oh, it was very cruel, when true love was crossed in that way, and all because Mr. Freely was a confectioner. Well, Penny would be true to him for all that, and since his being a confectioner gave her an opportunity of showing her faithfulness, she was glad of it. Edward Freely was a pretty name, much better than John Towers. Young Towers had offered her a rose out of his buttonhole the other day, blushing very much, but she refused it, and thought with delight how much Mr. Freely would be comforted if he knew her firmness of mind. Poor little Penny! The days were so very long among the daisies on a grazing farm, and thought is so active. How was it possible that the inward drama should not get the start of the outward? I have known young ladies much better educated, and with an outward world diversified by instructive lectures, to say nothing of literature and high-developed fancy-work, who have spun a cocoon of visionary joys and sorrows for themselves, just as Penny did. Her elder sister, Letitia, who had a prouder style of beauty and a more worldly ambition, was engaged to a wood factor, who came all the way down from Cattleton to see her. And everybody knows that a wool factor takes a very high rank, sometimes driving a double-bodied jig. Letty's notions got higher every day, and Penny never dared to speak of her cherished griefs to her lofty sister, never dared to propose that they should call at Mr. Freely's to buy licorice, though she had prepared for such an incident by mentioning a slight sore throat. So she had to pass the shop on the other side of the marketplace, and reflect with a suppressed sigh that behind those pink and white jars somebody was thinking of her tenderly, unconscious of the small space that divided her from him. And it was quite true that, when business permitted, Mr. Freely thought a great deal of Penny. He thought her prettiness comparable to the loveliest things in confectionery. He judged her to be of submissive temper, likely to wait upon him as well as if she had been a negress, and to be silently terrified when his liver made him irritable. And he considered the Palfrey family quite the best in the parish, possessing marriageable daughters. On the whole, he thought her worthy to become Mrs. Edward Freely, and all the more so because it would probably require some ingenuity to win her. Mr. Palfrey was capable of horsewhipping a too rash pretender to his daughter's hand, and, moreover, he had three tall sons. It was clear that a suitor would be at a disadvantage with such a family, unless travel and natural acumen had given him a countervailing power of contrivance.' 
and the first idea that occurred to him in the matter was that Mr. Palfrey would object less if he knew that the Freelys were a much higher family than his own. It had been foolish modesty in him hitherto to conceal the fact that a branch of the Freelys held a manor in Yorkshire, and shut up the portrait of his great-uncle, the Admiral, instead of hanging it up where a family portrait should be hung, over the mantelpiece in the parlour. Admiral Freely, K.C.B., once placed in this conspicuous position, was seen to have one arm only, and one eye, in these points resembling the heroic Nelson, while a certain pallid insignificance of feature confirmed the relationship between himself and his grand-nephew. Next, Mr. Freely was seized with an irrepressible ambition to possess Mrs. Palfrey's receipt for brawn, hers being pronounced on all hands to be superior to his own, as he informed her in a very flattering letter carried by his errand boy. Now Mrs. Palfrey, like other geniuses, wrought by instinct rather than by rule, and possessed no receipts. Indeed, despised all people who used them, observing that people who pickled by book must pickle by weights and measures, and such nonsense. As for herself, her weights and measures were the tip of her finger and the tip of her tongue, and if you went nearer, why, of course, for dry goods like flour and spice, you went by handfuls and pinches, and for wet there was a middle-sized jug, quite the best thing, whether for much or little, because you might know how much a teacup full was, if you got any use of your senses, and you might be sure it would take five middle-sized jugs to make a gallon. Knowledge of this kind is like Titian's colouring, difficult to communicate, and, as Mrs. Palfrey, once remarkably handsome, had now become rather stout and asthmatical, and scarcely ever left home, her oral teaching could hardly be given anywhere except at Long Meadows. Even a matron is not insusceptible to flattery, and the prospect of a visitor, whose great object would be to listen to her conversation, was not without its charms to Mrs. Palfrey. Since there was no receipt to be sent in reply to Mr. Freely's humble request, she called on her more docile daughter, Penny, to write a note, telling him that her mother would be glad to see him and talk with him on brawn any day that he could call at Long Meadows. Penny obeyed with a trembling hand, thinking how wonderfully things came about in this world. In this way, Mr. Freely got himself introduced into the home of the Palfreys, and notwithstanding a tendency in the male part of the family to jeer at him a little as peaky and bow-legged, he presently established his position as an accepted and frequent guest. Young Towers looked at him with increasing disgust when they met at the house on a Sunday, and secretly longed to try his ferret upon him, as a piece of vermin which that valuable animal would be likely to tackle with unhesitating vigour. But, so blind sometimes are parents, neither Mr. nor Mrs. Palfrey suspected that Penny would have anything to say to a tradesman of questionable rank, whose youthful bloom was much withered. Young Towers, they thought, had an eye to her, and that was likely enough to be a match some day, but Penny was a child at present. And all the while Penny was imagining the circumstances under which Mr. Freely would make her an offer, perhaps down by the row of damson trees when they were in the garden before tea perhaps by letter in which case how could the letter begin dearest penelope or my dear miss penelope or straight off without dear anything as seemed the most natural when people are embarrassed but however he might make the offer she would not accept it without her father's consent she would always be true to mr freely but she would not disobey her father for Penny was a good girl, though some of her female friends were afterwards of opinion that it spoke ill for her not to have felt an instinctive repugnance to Mr. Freely. But he was cautious, and wished to be quite sure of the ground he trod on. His views on marriage were not entirely sentimental, but were as duly mingled with considerations of what would be advantageous to a man in his position, as if he had had a very large amount of money spent on his education. He was not a man to fall in love in the wrong place, and so he applied himself quite as much to conciliate the favour of the parents as to secure the attachment of Penny. Mrs. Palfrey had not been inaccessible to flattery, and her husband, being also of mortal mould, would not, it might be hoped, be proof against rum. 
that very fine Jamaica rum, of which Mr. Freely expected always to have a supply sent him from Jamaica. It was not easy to get Mr. Palfrey into the parlour behind the shop, where the mild back street light fell on the features of the heroic admiral. But by getting hold of him rather late one evening, as he was about to return home from Grimworth, the aspiring lover succeeded in persuading him to sup on some collared beef, which, after Mrs. Palfrey's born, he would find the very best of cold eating. From that hour, Mr. Freely felt sure of success. Being in privacy with an estable man old enough to be his father, and being rather lonely in the world, it was natural he should unbosom himself a little on the subjects which he could not speak of in a mixed circle, especially concerning his expectations from his uncle in Jamaica, who had no children, and loved his nephew Edward better than any one else in the world, though he had been so hurt at his leaving Jamaica that he had threatened to cut him off with a shilling. However, he had since written to state his full forgiveness, and though he was an eccentric old gentleman, and could not bear to give away money during his life, Mr. Freely could show Mr. Palfrey the letter which declared plainly enough who would be the affectionate uncle's heir. Mr. Palfrey actually saw the letter, and could not help admiring the spirit of the nephew, who declared that such brilliant hopes as these made no difference to his conduct. He should work at his humble business, and make his modest fortune at it all the same. If the Jamaica estate was to come to him, well and good. It was nothing very surprising for one of the Freely family to have an estate left him, considering the lands that family had possessed in time gone by, nay, still possessed in the Northumberland branch. Would not Mr. Palfrey take another glass of rum? And also look at the last year's balance of the accounts. Mr. Freely was a man who cared to possess personal virtues, and did not pique himself on his family, though some men would. We know how easily the great Leviathan may be led, when once there is a hook in his nose or a bridle in his jaws. Mr. Palfrey was a large man, but, like Leviathan's, his bulk went against him when once he had taken a turning. He was not a mercurial man, who easily changed his point of view. Enough. Before two months were over, he had given his consent to Mr. Freely's marriage with his daughter Penny, and having hit on a formula by which he could justify it, fenced off all doubts and objections, his own included. The formula was this. I'm not a man to put my head up an entry before I know where it leads. Little Penny was very proud and fluttering, but hardly so happy as she expected to be in an engagement. She wondered if young Towers cared much about it, for he had not been to the house lately, and her sister and brothers were rather inclined to sneer than to sympathise. Grimworth rang with the news. All men extolled Mr. Freely's good fortune, while the women, with the tender solicitude characteristic of the sex, wished the marriage might turn out well. While affairs were at this triumphant juncture, Mr. Freely one morning observed that a stone carver who had been breakfasting in the eating-room, had left a newspaper behind. It was the Exshire Gazette, and Exshire being a county not unknown to Mr. Freely, he felt some curiosity to glance over it, and especially over the advertisements. A slight flush came over his face as he read. It was produced by the following announcement. If David Foe, son of Jonathan Foe, late of Gillsbrook, will apply to the office of Mr. Strutt, attorney, of Rodham, he will hear of something to his advantage. "'Father's dead!' exclaimed Mr. Freely involuntarily. "'Can he have left me a legacy?' End of chapter 2